I got you drunk. Somebody else tonight. 
All right, let's go to God in prayer together. Gracious Heavenly Father and Almighty God, we come tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, thanking you that we are able to be here in your sanctuary this evening. So, Father, as we call out my name, all these that we have listed here, Lord, you, you knew it before we did, but you told us to come together as a church for prayer. And that's what we're doing tonight. So, we're just coming to you with these needs. You know what they are. And those who need this healing touch, you minister. We were to make a list of everybody that you have answered prayer for, and we would be here for hours because we have prayed and prayed, and you have healed people, and you have brought people through things. And we thank you for that. So now we're just believing by faith as we pray for every one of these here tonight. Perhaps those who are tuned in on Facebook or they, they may have particular needs that, that you can help them with, and we just lift them up in prayer tonight too, Father. So now as we continue throughout the services in any of our Bible study, we're here to worship you. That's what we're here to do. So as we continue that, Holy Spirit, I pray that you just... Just have your way among us. In your name, Jesus, we ask it by faith. And his saints would say, we love you, Lord. Amen, amen and amen. amen. Brother Randall is going to come. We're going to worship him as we give this evening. Brother Randall. Father, they give her a blessing, not a burden. They keep a threat to her own mother. And I have to get you out to her down. I mean, uh, Make each one of us grateful in Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Randall. Brother John Aker and Brother Gary Ericsson. Sometimes I have a lot of my grandma over my kid. That muscle, grab that muscle. I said, no, I know you're jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, I said, I know you're jealous. My That's it. That big muscle on that arm. Brisk in the arm. I don't have muscle. I got brisk. Oh, what a man in the Bible today.
Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. So, when he had received food, he was strengthened. And then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Wow, things are changing quick for old Saul. Father, we thank you tonight for another opportunity to look into this word. And we thank you, Lord, for, for people like Saul people like Ananias and like these apostles who obeyed your commands and did what you asked him to do it's because of them that we have this gospel which we are hearing today so now I just pray as you had your Holy Spirit Lord to guide Luke in putting these words down for us that you guide us now as we study them so that we may be better disciples and better yet that we would be better evangelists in this lost world. We'll give you the thanks and praise. And all the saints that drink of God, we said, Amen. Amen. A lot of people don't like to be called a saint. You might be one of them. Oh, I ain't no saint. Well, that's what they call those who are in Christ. Uh, you, you know, I think some saints have given saints a bad name. <laughs> But saints set saints aside <laughs> in the sense, I need to get off of that. But it's just a simple fact that a saint, a saint is one who is in Christ. I mean, that's how, that's how they looked at them. They were saints and not the saints. So the, the word Christian didn't come about. We'll see how it comes about. But the word Christian didn't come about at the outstart. And, and they, were called, they were called the saints. And you know where the word saints comes from? Sanctified. That, that's where the word saint comes from. Set apart. Sanctified. All right, let's look at your notes. Now, Saul, <clears throat> it, it's interesting because now he's staying in the house of one of the very people that he was on his way to arrest. You thought about that. Remember, he was on his way to Damascus to arrest saints, to arrest those in Christ. Now he ends up in the house of one of them. He is still blind from his encounter, and he is praying to God as he awaits his fate. See, when, you know, we know the whole story of, of Saul and Paul, so it, it's easy for us to look ahead and say, well, we know what happens to him. He had no idea what was going to happen to him. I mean, all he knows is he met Jesus, and Jesus said, you're not going to get away from me. It's hard for you to kick against these goats. You're not going to get away from me. So then he said, well, what have I got to do? He said, you go to Damascus, and then I'll tell you what you got to do. So he didn't know what his fate was going to be. He had no idea that Jesus was going to use him as one of the major apostles to build his church. See, he, he told Ananias what he was going to do with him, but he hadn't told Paul that yet. So this has to be, had to be probably the longest three days of Paul's life. Think about that. Just, just for a minute, if you were in his place, and the, the very one that you were persecuting, the very one you stood and hold coats for while they killed one of his saints, has come to you and has blinded you and has told you to go to Damascus and then he'll take care of you when you get down there. When you get there, then I'll tell you what you must do. That had to be a long three days. <laughs> he wondered. That's why when Luke puts here that he was praying. Yeah, I bet he was. Because Paul understood what prayer was. 
I mean, he was a Pharisee. He knew about praying to God. So I, I would say if we had the prayer written out, there was probably a lot of, a lot of apologizing going on in that prayer. A lot of repentance, no doubt, that Paul would, would have been praying. That, that's just something you, you would have to do. Now let's look at look verses 10 through 12. And I'll read them again, and then we'll break them down. A certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, or behold, or look here, he is praying. And in a vision, he seen a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. There used to be a place in Christiansburg called Straight Street. I don't know if you like, but our, our church, when, when we were here, I was associate with, well, when I was youth pastor, actually, before I became associate, we went there. Remember that? We took the kids down to Straight Street, and what they did, the teens come together, and each church would do a little skit. This was before the day of Teen Tyler. And they'd do a little skit, and then they'd have hamburgers and hot dogs. You know they'd be food if I was going. But it was, a, it was a fun time. It was called Straight Street, and that's, that's where they got the name from. But here, Ananias, on your notes, is it, another one that Saul was coming after. But Saul didn't realize who Ananias was, even though he was going there to arrest Christians. He was going there to arrest saints. So Ananias is going to play a major role in Saul's commissioning, or what we would call the ordaining for mission. And Jesus had told Ananias that Paul was going to be a vessel for him. They hadn't known Paul this yet. Remember, he told Paul, you go to Damascus, and then I'm going to tell you what you will do from there. So Paul didn't know, but Ananias got the word. Jesus had told him, for your blank, make, make a note, it should be noted, that God is working in both men at the same time. Now the reason that's important is because there are people who will come and say, God has told me to tell you this for, for your life. And you've heard me tell, tell the story. Kent Lewis came and said, God told me to tell you to give me $100. And then Kent grinned and said, and I can see he hadn't said a word to you about it. And, and that's a lesson in the sense of what, what we pay attention to here. God's working in the lives of both men at the same time. Ananias don't know everything that he had said to Paul on the road. And Paul has no idea what Jesus has said to Ananias, but Paul knows through a vision that a man named Ananias is coming to lay hands on him, and God told Ananias, Paul is prepared for you to do this. Now that, that's what you take note of. So it, it's a God thing when it comes together as that did. So that's important to notice the information that Jesus gives to Ananias because that was that was news to, the, to that saint that day. Now verse 13 and 14 so Ananias answered him and he said Lord I've heard from many about this man and how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem and, and even here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind and take prisoner or arrest all who call on your name. Ananias is just as much human as St. Peter was. You know, Peter never had a problem going up and, and questioning things that maybe Jesus had said or th things that he had told him. It, you know, Peter was, was on the forefront to, to ask about. Ananias is no different. You, you find it in, in one sense, you kind of find it funny because you think the Lord of Lords is telling you what to do, Ananias. <laughs> and then you would think, I mean, you would think a holier-than-thou attitude would say, I'll do it. I ain't worried about nothing. I don't care. Ananias didn't catch it that way. Ananias just simply says, uh, 
We've heard about this guy before. I mean, we've heard about him. Are you sending me to my death? I mean, are you sending me to this guy so that he can arrest me and that he can take me to Jerusalem? He said, you know, we, we've heard about this man. Yeah, news, news travels fast. I mean, it, it always does. So they knew, and they said Saul was on his way, and he was coming to Damascus. And then the word got around that he was there. He's here. He's in Damascus. He's over at Judas's house. You know, and they knew. They knew the authority that he had from the chief, from the chief priest. So Ananias just simply says, I don't know. <laughs> Are you sure? Because we know that, that this guy has done a lot of harm to your saints in Jerusalem. So he's, he's saying, I'm sure that's probably what he's come here to do. Now, here's, here's the thing to note about it. Jesus never rebuked him, did he? That's in your blank. Jesus never rebukes him for saying what he did. As Christ knows the fear they all felt after knowing that Stephen was stoned. If, if there's one thing we can take to heaven, knowing about Jesus is we can be confident in that he knows everything. It, it may be a surprise to us, but it's not a surprise to him, is it, Father Murphy? No. He knew it was going to be Paul that he was going to choose to take his word to the Gentiles even before Stephen was stoned. God knew who it was going to be. Nobody else knew. It looked like to the rest of the world that, that this thing was being wiped out, that this man Saul was cracking down Christians and putting them to death, and taking them to prison where they would be put to death. <clears throat> so it looked like on the outside that, that Jesus wasn't really in touch with what Saul had been doing to the saints. Sure he was. Sure he was. So when we see things happening today, when, when the age-old question a lot of bad things happen to good people because we're people. We're people. God's not a respecter of persons because, see, this, this life is temporary. This body is temporary. This world is temporary. Everything here is temporary. It's passing away sooner or later, but this word will never pass away. So that, that's why Paul who is Saul at this time, would make the statement to the Romans, if the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he will also give eternal life to your mortal bodies. But right here, they're in the flesh. They're human. And they don't, they don't understand everything that God is allowing to happen. And, and it was the same way as I preached Sunday at the triumphal entry. They had actually thought for that short time span they, they was believing in Jesus as the Messiah. They were saying, Son of David, Hosanna, you know, you're here to save us. Glory to God in the highest. But he didn't do what they wanted him to do. And then when he was put on the cross, that just sort of knocked the wind out of their sails. Because why, why would a powerful God, an almighty God, who was that powerful and that sovereign, allow his only begotten son to be treated that way? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense logically. God doesn't deal in logic. God deals in grace. And God deals in mercy. And, and God deals in sovereignty. He does what he wants to do and how he wants to do it. And it's, sometimes it's confusing to us. And it was confusing to Ananias. He said, Lord, I've heard about this man. He's done a lot of harm up in Jerusalem. But now look what, look what Jesus says to him. Jesus didn't rebuke him. He didn't say, oh, you have little faith. <clears throat> he didn't say, just do what I tell you to do and leave the rest of it to me because that's not, that's not Christ. He understands their fear. He, he knows how the word spread when when Stephen was stoned. But the Lord said to him, here's what he told Ananias. Ananias just said, I heard this man's coming to kill him. He can't just take us back to Jerusalem. 
and they've been put to death up there. But the Lord said to him, go, in other words, you don't have to be afraid, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. You might want to highlight that part right there. He is a chosen vessel of mine. Listen, when God chooses you to do something for him, it's going to get done. And, and he chooses us all. I, I mean, we all have things that he has for us to do. But Ananias was looking at the human side, and Ananias would have thought, this guy is never going to help, help you, Lord. But then Jesus said, well, yes, he is, because he's a chosen vessel of mine. You, you know, the human side would say, well, if I was you, I'd have killed him on that road to Damascus. I mean, I'd have wiped him out, and it wouldn't, you wouldn't have any more problems. But no, God's got big plans for Saul. He's a chosen vessel of mine. And here's what he's going to do. He's going to bear my name before Gentiles, kings. Gentiles were pagans to the Jews. Kings and the children of Israel. He's got the whole group. Now see, up until this point, Peter and the other apostles who are all Jews are pretty much looking out for the Jews. Uh, I mean, because they're Jewish and they know that they're God's chosen people and they figure that the Messiah has come just for the Jews. He said, well, how do you know that? We're going to see that as we go through this book. Well, that's why you hear me say sometimes that to the Orthodox Jews, the rest of us are just fuel for the fire. And, and that's, that's how they see that. But God had a different plan. He's going to bear my name before the pagans and the kings and Children of Israel, you want to remember that because we're going to see as we go through this book that he preaches to all three of these groups. For I will show him, I'll show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Jesus assures Ananias that he has nothing to fear because he's got great plans for Saul. Now, take note to those who will be witnessing too. The Gentiles, the kings, those who are in leadership, and the children of Israel. Jews aren't left out. So he's going to let, let them know about Christ too. And he also lets Ananias know that Saul is not being rewarded. That's your, that's your blank. He is not being rewarded for his acts against Christ's saints. Because suffering will be his lot as he takes the gospel to whom, to those whom Jesus was sending. So, see, G Jesus knew how Ananias felt about Saul. <clears throat> and it had to be confusing for Ananias to have the Lord say to him, it would have been the same difference as the guy that went in the church in South Carolina and shot the people in Bible study. You, you remember that when the boy went in and shot those people in Bible study. It, it would have been the same if, if Christ had told one of those saints in that church, I want you to go to that young man and I want you to take him into your house and I want you to lift him up because I'm going to use him as a preacher. Why? I mean, he just came in my church and he shot a pastor. He shot my, and you're telling me, see, there's confusion there. But that's, that's why Jesus understood about it in life. And he said, but look, he's not going to get off the hook. It, it looks like, it looks like when I say he's going to bear my name, he's not going to do it <laughs> prosperously. He, he is going to suffer the rest of his life for me. But now Paul says that in some of his letters. Paul, Paul said everything that I have done before I come to Christ, I count it all what? Done. <laughs> Waits. He said everything that I did before I came to Christ is nothing. It's only what I've done for Christ that amounts to anything. But he would have to learn that lesson. And here at the outstart, he tells that advice, oh, he's going to get his. He's going to get his. 
because he's going to suffer a whole time. He takes my name out there, and then eventually, he didn't tell my advice, but eventually he's going to be killed as well. Just like the saints he saw die, he's going to die for me too. He's going to be killed for me as well. So there's a plan there that Ananias didn't, didn't understand. But Ananias did what the Lord told him to do, verses 17 and 18. So he was convinced, and Ananias went in his way. He, he did what Jesus told him, what the Lord told him. He went into the house. Don't, don't you know he kind of snuck in there? <laughs> I don't think he'd run in there hollering, Hallelujah, I'm here to save Saul. I think he was probably peeping around and see where he was and to see what he was doing. He went his way, he entered the house, and then he laid his hands on him and he said, now, now take note of this, Brother Saul. Why do you think he called him brother? Could it have been something Jesus said to Ananias that made that happen? Yeah. He's one of mine. So Ananias said, if he's yours, he's my brother. What's that yours? Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me. Boy, that, that had to be said, didn't it? Now you know why I'm here. And see, Paul knew that dream. Paul knew the vision that he had, that he saw. And Ananias says, he sent me. Here's why he sent me. Here's why. So that you may, number one, receive your sight. And, number two, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke, who is a physician, says, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. How did Luke know that? Luke's a doctor, but how did he know it happened? That's all told him. See, Luke's writing what he's told, what he's being guided. So, so Paul told Luke, and when Ananias laid his hands on him, boom, it's like scales fell off my eyes, covering fell off my eyes, and immediately they fell off, and I seen my sight at once. It didn't, it didn't gradually come back. It was immediate. And he arose and was baptized. And Ananias obeyed him, and upon the arrival, he assured Saul that Jesus has sent him. <clears throat> see, Saul's waiting to see what's going to happen to him. It was three days in the dark. No food, no water, you know, one of the things in counseling, one of the things I was taught, one of the things I always ask when, when people have issues, you can ask yourself that, and you counsel yourself, are you eating good and are you sleeping good? Because if you're not eating good and you're not sleeping good, you're not thinking clear. That's just how it, that's just how it works. The brain has to have sugar to work and it has to have rest. And if, you're, if you don't eat good, and you don't sleep good, and you don't, you don't think good, it had been three days, it had nothing to eat. He was, he was fasting. So you know that in the, in, the physical, in the physical, he was suffering, and then he had to be suffering mentally. Can't see nothing, you're in the dark. You don't know if you're going to be blind for the rest of your life. You don't know if that was punishment from God. You're waiting to see what's going on, and then you have this vision. And then you're waiting for this guy. And in three days he comes. And he lays hands on him. And he said, I'm here so that you may receive your sight. And that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. So at that moment, Saul realizes, or, or so he thinks, that probably Christ ain't have to kill him. Not yet anyway, Right? Because he gave him his sight back and he said he's going to fill you with his Holy Spirit. So that, that, was, that was a positive for Paul. So it's a fact, as I said, he's not being rewarded for what he did to the saints, but Jesus has got a plan for him. Now, laying his hands on him to commission him, 
was just like we saw the saints when they were in Samaria, and they came down and they laid hands on the people, and they received the Holy Spirit. And as we learned in that lesson, man cannot give you the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but the laying on of the hands has to do with commissioning. It's symbolic that authority or power is being transferred from one to another. And, and that's how it was always even in the Old Testament. So the fact he laid hands on him and commissioned him for what he was going to do, I don't know exactly what, what words he said to Paul or, he, you know, he said, I've come to receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was, apparently, when he laid his hands on him and commissioned him. And the covering that protected his eyes fell off. Think about that. When Christ came to him on the road and the scales of that which was on his eyes, don't you think maybe that light would have been so bright it would have burned his eyes out had they not been covered or protected? So the fact that he was blind, that he was being protected, because at that moment, at that moment, Paul didn't know if he was on Christ's side or not, did he? So, so he was protected at that moment. You and I cannot come into the presence of a holy God on our own. That, that's, that's the hardest thing to get people to understand in the world today is that anybody can go to God at any time. And, and that he's going to hear you. Now, if you're a sinner, if you're a sinner, he's going, he's going to hear that prayer. If you're reaching out to him and you, and you want to be a part of him and, and you want to be saved and you want to be his child, he's going to hear that. But you don't have audience with him unless you go through Christ. Because we cannot stand in the presence of a holy God, but Jesus stands in his presence for us. He is our intercessor. He's the one that, that takes our place. Remember when the disciples was on the boat, and Jesus told them, cast you down out there and catch all these fish, and they've done that. Remember what Peter did? He fell at his feet, and he said, get away from me, because he knew at that moment this man, Jesus, was God in the flesh, and he figured he was going to be consumed at that moment because of the holiness of God and the unholiness of Peter. And that's when Jesus said, you guys are little faith. That's what he had come to do, that he fills that gap. So anyway, <clears throat> verse 18 here holds a mystery for some, and I say for some because you, you know how many mysteries work. But the verse 18 here, <clears throat> I, did, I did some classes in school in, in a back, at a Baptist seminary, an online Baptist seminary, because our seminary didn't offer online classes, and I couldn't go to Oklahoma to school. So the Baptist seminary out, out of Georgia, I did online through, you know, through the Dallas Theological Seminary. But when I entered that, when I started that, I told them up front, I said, I'm a Pentecostal preacher, and I believe the full gospel as it is given and as I understand it. So if you accept me in the school, understand that some of the things I believe may differ from some of the things you believe. And one of the professors would go back and say, don't worry about it. You, you give us your take on it. If it's scriptural, that's the good part, isn't it? If it's scriptural, there won't be any issues. And there wasn't. There wasn't any issues with that. But, but this was one of the big areas of discussion, like a 20-page report. <laughs> Here, here's, here's a discussion on, on 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. He received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Was he baptized with water or was he baptized with the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit? Both? I'm just listening. What do you think? I mean, read it. Go, read it. Look at it. Look at it. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. Now look what Ananias said. I've come, you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. He received his sight at once, and he arose and went back. Possibly both, wouldn't it? Possibly both. Here, here's, here's the answer. <laughs> There's no evidence given as to whether it was one or both. No doubt he was baptized with water. No doubt. Because that's what they did to the Samaritans. Samaritans. Remember? When they went down, they were baptized. But now this baptizing doesn't say he was taken, he was taken to the river and put under it. You know, some of the baptisms that took place in those days, they actually poured water on their heads. And I was sprinkled in the Methodist church. I mean, they, they do that. They did that because it was a symbolic act of, of the baptism. But the whole point here is that Saul is in Christ. That's the point. Saul, Jesus said he's one of mine. He said he's a chosen vessel of mine. Even before he was filled with the Holy Spirit, even before he was baptized, Jesus said he's, he's one of mine. I, I have chosen him to do this. And then it said he was baptized. The point is there is no evidence given as to which or both, and in reality, it makes no difference. Paul, Paul, Saul had to be filled with the Holy Spirit to do what he did. He, he couldn't have not been filled with the Holy Spirit. And as far as his baptism goes, no doubt there was water involved, because that's what the early Christians did. So when Luke makes that statement, He's pretty much just, just saying to the guy he's writing to that he followed the same line that all the rest of the Christians did. He was baptized into Christ. And he was also filled with, with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and when I say there's no evidence there, to tell us one or the other, what am I talking about when I say there's no evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Come on, Pentecostals. No speaking in other tongues. What? No speaking in other tongues. Didn't say it, did it? Didn't say if he was or not. But in 1 Corinthians 14, the apostle wrote to the church, the same Saul. He said, I'm glad that, that I speak in tongues more than any of you. So, so there is tongues, but the evidence that we have here doesn't say that that happened at that very moment as it did for some believers. So that's why I say that's where you get the theological tug here. That, that's why we have to leave this thing to Christ to save us. We can't do it denominationally. We, we can't do it by our, by our own words. Christ is in charge. He said Paul's going to be a vessel of mine. I've chosen him to do this job. And that doesn't mean that Paul couldn't have rejected. Sure he could. Paul, Paul had the will that he could have rejected. He was afraid to, but he could have. He could have rejected it. He wasn't forced into it. That's why in, in the book of Romans we study, he gives a good, he gives a good teaching on what's called the election of the faith. And, and there are those who believe today, there's a denomination who believes today that you are elected to be saved or not. That, that there's, if you're one of the elect, you will come to Christ and you will be saved just as Paul was chosen. That, that, that's a doctrine of election. You, if you're elected, you will be. If you're not one of those who are elected, then you won't come to Christ and you won't be saved. Now, I don't know how you get that part of it because Jesus said, Whosoever will. He didn't say it. Some of you do. And, and he said, he told them, he said, you, no one comes to me except if my father calls him. Right? But Jesus turned right around and said, but didn't I call all of you and one of you as a devil? In other words, if I called the devil to be on my team, 
Wouldn't I call everybody else? Sure he does. Sure he calls everybody else. So it's not an election of, of grace as to whether or not you're shown grace for forgiveness of sin. You are. The, the election comes in as to whether or not you vote for it. If, if you want that grace and you want that salvation, then you've got to come through Christ to get it. It's not automatically impugned unto us. We have to receive it. But it's there for us if we want to receive it. So that, that's why there's a lot in that one verse, isn't it? Like I said, 20 page report. <clears throat> but there's no evidence as to given as to whether it was if it was water baptism or the Holy Spirit baptism, but we know that he found it had both. Now, in verse 19, so when he had received food, he was strengthened, so he ate. <clears throat> I'd like to have heard the conversation around the table when they were eating when he it. I'd love to have been there upon the wall, as they say, and when old Adam and I said, what happened on that road, Paul? You know he found and said that. What happened on that road, Saul? <laughs> Saul said, you ain't gonna believe that in life. <laughs> I was on my way here to get you. I was coming after you. <coughs> and Jesus knocked me down in the dirt. <laughs> and now we're on the same side. That's about what it, what it boiled down to. So now he spends time in Damascus with the very people he was on his way to arrest. Now, ain't that a God thing for you? Ain't that a God thing for you? Paul was going down there to arrest him and ends up becoming one of them. We got a saying for that, I don't know. Can't beat him, George. <laughs> right? Hey, ain't we, JB? If you can't whoop him, get on his side. You can't beat him, George. I mean, it's, it's pretty much Paul understood. Paul understood this thing now, where those disciples were coming from in their allegiance to Christ. Because now he knows without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus lives. There is no question in his mind about it. And he's going to have further encounters with Christ. They're right here at the outstart is what we're, we're seeing as to how it starts. Now, next time we're going to look at verses 20 through 31 because Luke goes back into a narrative uh, on this. It, it's not, not a lot of theological teaching in that, but it just tells Paul's or Saul's story. Now what happens? Where do we go from here? Where does Saul go from here? That's what we'll pick up next, next class. Questions or comments? Five minutes, eight o'clock. No questions. Oh, no. Oh, well, that's good and clear. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house and study this word. And as I said at the outstart, we thank you for the Apostle Paul. And we see how he was able to take this man who was, who was in allegiance to you, Father, but didn't believe in the Son until he had that encounter. And you know, Lord, I think that's what we all have to have in order to believe in you. We have to have an encounter. We have to meet you by way of the Holy Spirit. When our faith reaches out to you, and then you answer us, and we ask you to come into our hearts, and you do, it's at that moment we realize this thing is bigger than us, just as Saul did. So help us as we go forth to, to be good disciples and to be even better evangelists. During this Easter season, during these days, we have a glorious opportunity, not only in worship and in praise, but a glorious opportunity to witness. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise for it all. In your name, Jesus, we ask it. And the saints would say we love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Soup in the Word tomorrow. Starts at 12. We do it for an hour. 12 to 1. And then Friday night, we'll do Friday night communion service here in the church. And it, it will probably only be an hour. I mean, we shorten that up.
So if you get a chance, come on over. And then Sunday at the sunrise, Pastor Charlie D from the streets is going to be preaching our sunrise at 7. And we're going to do a drive-in service, but, but it's going to be both. Uh, we're going to set some chairs up in front of the stage that we'll set up. So if people want to get out and congregate, they can. Or if they want to show up like the guy did last year, that the guy from the community come over, don't go to church or anything, but he said, I had an opportunity to come over here in my pajamas and drink a cup of coffee and hear the word. So Charlie B and I said, we got to do that again. <laughs> they may be another one of them out there <laughs> that needs to try in in the pajamas and hear the word. So if we got an opportunity to get it to them that way, it worked once, then it might very well work for somebody else. Okay? And, and it's a good opportunity for people that, you know, that may be, may be physically challenged or, or in some way. They can drive right up and, and get, the, get everything right there at the moment. And if they want to get out and congregate, they can. They get out the car and cuddle in the group, whatever they want to do. So pray for that for us. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Randall, for doing this every week.